Okie doke. Okay, I think we can start. So we... Oh, should I leave the, leave the lights fully on? Okay. I think you'll see all, all the images okay from the back. In the last lecture on the visual system, we talked about transduction and encoding and got as far as the ganglion cells that leave the retina. And today I want to take you beyond that to the stage where we understand how the visual system is representing both small parts of an image, and this is very nicely uh, exemplified here by this uh, <coughs> painting of, by Picasso, um, where many of the local regions are defined both by colors <coughs> and by orientation of lines and the black and white features. <coughs> and you can see that some parts of, of body are beautifully defined by the difference in colors, the sort of object of the hand and the fingernails. But other parts we recognize really instantly. We recognize the face as a full object, even though it's built up of a whole bunch of different small parts. So what I'd like you to think of when you think about perceptual processing is that we're taking all these small parts, we're putting them together in some form of neural representation, and then we're building on them to actually make parts of bigger objects. And as I said, that the faces are really something that to you and I stand out. And it turns out that if you remember reading the very introductory part of chapter 10 of your textbook, and if you haven't, you should go back and read it again, that describes a woman, because she's still alive, denoted by the initials FA, that who was in a room where a heater malfunctioned and there was carbon monoxide in the room and she became unconscious she was taken to the emergency room. She recovered. She recovered consciousness. She was aware again. <laughs> but she had lost part of her visual processing. And the part that she had lost was her ability to recognize and name objects and particularly faces. And the condition of not being able to name or recognize people or faces is called... Uh, prosopagnosia, the, the agnosia is your perceptual inability and the proso is the faces. And so sometimes this happens by sort of naturally occurring accidents. Maybe someone might have a stroke or carbon monoxide poisoning. But interestingly, actually, there are also congenital forms of this that some people grow up not being able to recognize faces. And so these sort of naturally occurring experiments that happen with people can be taken advantage of by investigators. And actually, in the last 10, 15 years or so, we've also been able to use functional magnetic resonance imaging to actually look at the activity of the brain of humans in conditions or under perceptual conditions that are very hard to mimic in, in, in animals. Um, so the people have had strokes and damage to their brain. They've had damage in an area of the brain in the ventral part of the cortex called the fusiform gyrus when they're not able to recognize faces and objects. And it also turns out that when you, you do an FMRI, fMRI experiment, you can sit a normal, healthy subject down in front of a television screen and you can play them a whole sequence of faces while you're scanning the blood flow in their brain, which is effectively what the fMRI does. 
and you can look to see whether there's a change in or so-called activity and blood flow of the region when you show specifically faces or other control visual stimuli that are not faces. When you do that, when you look at the areas of the brain that become active when you show faces, what you see is a particular area at the base of the brain in the fusiform gyrus called, that has been called the fusiform face area, and that's shown in red here. And this is the increase in activity that you see when somebody, when subjects view faces. When they view houses, places, the blue line is the change in activity, effectively none. But there is a local region separated and more medial than the fusiform face area called the parahippocampal place area that becomes more active when people view houses. So you can now extend these kinds of experiments that were once only able to be done on patients or people who've had accidents to actually imaging. So we'll get back to this right at the end of the lecture, these high, sort of intermediate or higher areas of the visual processing hierarchy, which are destined to be important for signaling objects, bigger parts of scenes. But let's take a step back, because we haven't got there yet, and we'll go back to what comes out of the retina, and I just want to remind you that we talked about the rods and the cones, the bipolar cells, the retinal ganglion cells that come in two types, the on-center and the off-center, and we got to discussing their receptive fields. And remember, we put this into the perspective of saying that we wanted to look at transduction, sensory encoding, and then neural pathways, receptive fields, and topographic maps are those things, when they're combined, lead to our perception of shapes and colors and depth and to these higher level parts of object recognition. And just again to remind you from the first lecture, we also talked about the fact that there are quite pronounced species differences in how the neural apparatus is set up. And one of the examples I gave you was that in the ability to see fine gratings, the visual acuity, the rat is about 100 times poorer than the hawk and about 60 times poorer than we are. And so we'll see that there are big anatomical differences, differences in the pathways that can actually make, take into account these differences in behavior or performance. So the first thing we want to consider are the receptive fields of these retinal ganglion cells. And so I just wanted to remind you that in the retina, the cones and the bipolars, whoop, they have local potentials. The local potentials got cut off. You okay? I hate it when your coffee falls off. So the local potentials get turned into action potentials in the axons that come away from the retinal ganglion cells in the optic nerve. So remember in your sheet brain dissection, you turned the brains over and you saw the optic nerve going to the optic chiasm and you dissected that away. That's what's carrying the information out of the back of each of your eye. And in humans and in our close relatives, apes and, and old world monkeys, there are about a million of these retinal ganglion cells. And so you can imagine that there are a million of these cells on the back of the retina and each has a fine cable coming out, just like the sort of representation of, of the pixels of a television screen. So let's see what the receptive fields of these neurons are like, and this is quite nicely shown in this uh, little animation. So if we just watch the animation, I want you to look to see what the pattern of action potentials are in a retinal ganglion cell when the light 
comes onto the area of the visual field that that retinal ganglion cell is connected to by the cones which are receiving the light from the retina. That's called the receptive field. Visual processing begins in the retina, the receptive surface inside the back of the eye. Light enters the eye, passes through the layers of cells in the retina before reaching the photoreceptors, which are located at the back of the retina. Light activates the photoreceptors, which modulate the activity of bipolar cells. Bipolar cells, in turn, connect with ganglion cells located at the front of the retina. The axons of the ganglion cells form the optic nerve, which carries information to the brain. Two other types of neurons, horizontal cells and amacrine cells, are primarily responsible for lateral interactions within the retina. The bipolar cells and ganglion cells are organized in such a way that each cell responds to a small circular patch of photoreceptors, which defines the cell's receptive field. The receptive fields of retinal ganglion cells are concentric, consisting of a roughly circular central area and a surrounding ring. Retinal ganglion cells have two basic types of receptive fields, on-center off-surround and off-center on-surround. The center and its surround are always antagonistic and tend to cancel each other's activity. Let's look at the response of an on-center ganglion cell to a spot of light. When no light is falling on the receptive field, a spontaneous level of activity is recorded from the ganglion cell. To see what happens when a spot of light enters the receptive field, use the mouse to position the beam of light so that it falls on either the center or surround of the receptive field. So here are the action potentials. Here's an audio view of the action potentials. So now I'm in the antagonistic surround, so I have an increase of light in the off surround, and so that turns down the response. Now if I put the, the light in the center, now I turn up the number of action potentials. I turn them down. No light on the receptive field, you just have a constant spontaneous rate of response. Notice that when the light enters the surround region on this on-center ganglion cell, the level of activity recorded in the cell decreases. Conversely, a spot of light in the center of the receptive field increases the firing rate. A maximal response in an on-center ganglion cell is achieved when the entire center of the receptive field is illuminated. Likewise, if we illuminate only the surround with a ring of light, the ganglion cell is maximally inhibited. Note that if we illuminate both the center and surround region, the response is just above baseline. This occurs because center effects are slightly stronger than surround. Now let's look at the response of an off-center ganglion cell. To see what happens when a spot of light enters the receptive field, use the mouse to position the beam of light so that it falls on either the center or surround of the receptive field. So you know what's going to happen. So if we go into the surround, an increment in light in the receptive field center of an off ganglion cell will reduce the response. So if I had a constant light on the receptive field and then I decreased the amount of light in this receptive field center, this cell would increase its response. It's off center. It turns on to a decrement in light. If I show it a bar of light, it won't care whether the bar is vertical or oblique or horizontal because it doesn't know anything about the 
orientation of the bar. And so this is a really central thing about how the visual system is organized. The retina doesn't know about the features of the orientation, or if I'm moving something, it doesn't know whether I'm moving it to the left or the right or up or down. At least a single cell doesn't know about that. So just keep, keep that in mind. Notice that when the light enters the surround region of this off-center ganglion cell, the level of activity recorded in the cell increases. Conversely, a spot of light in the center of the receptive field decreases the firing rate. If we illuminate the entire center of an off-center ganglion cell, the cell is maximally inhibited. A maximal response is achieved when the entire surround of the receptive field is illuminated. As with the on-center ganglion cell, if we illuminate both the center and surround region, the response changes very little from baseline. As you can see, uniform illumination of the visual field is less effective in activating a ganglion cell than is a well-placed small spot or a line or edge passing through the center of the cell's receptive field. This organization makes the ganglion cells sensitive to differences in the level of illumination across the receptive field, or what is called luminance contrast. Did it die? Should I press continue? To understand the importance of luminance contrast, use the mouse to drag the receptive field across the boundary between light and dark shown above. Note how the response rate changes depending on the position of the receptive field. By combining information from adjacent receptive fields, the brain can thus construct information about edges and ultimately shapes. So remember we, we, we emphasized that one of the things that the photoreceptors don't know about. They don't know about contrast. They're just responding to the change in the number of photons that are coming in. Whereas now we've gone one step in processing in the, in the visual circuit, one or well, two steps further, and now the cells are telling you about the differences in brightness between objects. So let's just uh, drag this across the, so when we're in the center, there's no response. When I remove the on center to the bright part of the receptor of the light, I get an increase in response. When I bring it to the dark region, it doesn't change much. This graph shows the responses of a hypothetical population of on-center ganglion cells whose receptive fields, labeled I to V, are distributed across a light-dark edge. Those cells whose activity is most affected have receptive fields whose center region lies adjacent to the light-dark edge. Thus, the information supplied by the retina to the brain does not give equal weight to all parts of the visual scene. Rather, it emphasizes features of the visual scene, such as boundaries and edges, that convey the most important information. So that the slide before the last one, which had a whole bunch of receptor fields going across the boundary, that exemplifies why we, why we need not just one or two retinal ganglion cells, but we need that whole huge number because every part of your visual field has to be tiled by these small receptive fields. And they don't move around, they stay in position. It's only when the light goes across them in one place or another or another on the retina that you actually get a response. So Ultimately, the way perception works, it's the population of neurons 
that is responding, not just the individual ones. But to understand how that works, we can ask questions about the individual neurons and assume that neurons in different places of the visual field are behaving approximately in the same way. Except there are some differences, right? So the output from the retina is in these axons of the uh, optic nerve. And you saw this in your sheet brain dissection. And we discovered earlier on that in central vision, where we have the most acute vision, then we have one cone going to one retinal ganglion cell. And I'll just tell you that the next part of the pathway, if you remember from your anatomy, is, and we'll go over this again, is the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. So the axons of the retinal ganglion cells go out to the thalamus and they make their first synapse on those cells there. So that's what, when you see LGN, it means lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. And in the central retina, there's one cone to one retinal ganglion cell. And if you remember, there were very many cones in central retina. And when you looked further peripherally, you got fewer and fewer cones and many, many rods. And another thing about the cones in the periphery is that you get many cones coming to one retinal ganglion cell. So you get convergence. So the peripheral retina, you get many cones going to one retinal ganglion cell. So this is one of the principles you've learned about how the brain works, that there's convergence and divergence. So in peripheral retina, this is a beautiful example of convergence of the cones onto one retinal ganglion cell. And similarly, for the rods, there's always many rods connecting to the rod bipolar connecting to one retinal ganglion cell. So again, that's convergence. So what we learned about is the receptive fields, and we want to ask questions about how they lead to the uh, detection or the perception of shape and color and movement and depth. And just give you a brief summary of where we're going to go now. We're going to, we've discussed the transformation of the visual signals in the retina and the central thalamus, the LGN. We're going to ask questions about how the primary visual cortex represents the components of the image. And then we're going to go on from there to discuss some areas of the cortical representation that's ahead of the visual cortex. So in you and I, the visual cortex is at the back of the brain, and the visual parts of the brain that are extra stray or pre stray are in front of that. So if you remember, we had three components to our five component list that made up how we're going to understand objects and representation. There were the receptive fields, there were the pathways, and there were the topology or the topographic maps. So you just have to want to ask, where does that information from the retina actually go? And it goes to many places, but three of them that uh, have sort of significance for different parts of behavior is that one set of very specialized cells, I'm not going to tell you about them, but they'll actually come up a little bit in the animation, go from the retina to the hypothalamus um, to a nucleus which is involved in determining the circadian rhythm. And you'll learn about that in, in later lectures. <coughs> um, there are other fibers that go from the retina directly to a nucleus in the midbrain called the superior colliculus, so retinocollicular, and that is important for controlling where you're looking at where you're looking, the eye movements. And remember, you need visual signals to tell you where to point your eyes. The cortex also sends information back to the colliculus. But the main pathway that we use to actually be aware of visual objects, to reconstruct objects, is the pathway from the retina through the lateral geniculate to the primary visual cortex.
And that slight, this is from your book, where the output of the eyes is shown here in these two different uh, colors. And it'll be exemplified a little bit more in this uh, next animation. So this is going to talk about the output of the retina to these different uh, nuclei of the brain. So this, these are the pathways part of the uh, process. The human eye has many of the features of a camera, starting with a lens to focus light. The cornea of the eye bends light rays and is primarily responsible for forming the image on the retina, the receptive surface inside the back of the eye. The visual image focused on the retina is inverted top to bottom and reversed right to left. The part of the world that you can see without moving your head or eyes is called your visual field. Each eye sees only a portion of this visual field. The visual field can be divided into right and left visual hemifields. The right visual hemifield is seen by the temporal left retina and nasal right retina, while the left visual hemifield is seen by the nasal left retina and the temporal right retina. The visual field can also be divided vertically into superior and inferior divisions. Note that the visual fields of both eyes overlap extensively in the central portion of each hemifield. This region defines the binocular field of view. Vision in the periphery of the field of view is strictly monocular, mediated by the most medial portion of the nasal retina. The center of the visual field projects its image onto the foveal region of the retina. On the retina, the highly specialized fovea has a dense concentration of small diameter cones and a one-to-one -one relationship between the cones and the bipolar and ganglion cells. Visual acuity is therefore especially high in this region. Now let's examine the pathways from the retina into the brain. This diagram shows a view of the base of the brain as seen from below. Note that in this view, the position of the two eyes is reversed. The axons of retinal ganglion cells exit the retina via the optic nerve. The optic nerve exits the eye in a region called the optic disc. Because there are no receptors in this region, nothing can be seen in the corresponding part of the visual field. This blind spot does not appear to us as a dark spot. Rather, it is simply a region from which we cannot obtain visual information. The optic nerves cross at the optic chiasm which is located just anterior to the stalk of the pituitary gland. In humans, axons from the nasal retina cross over to the opposite side of the brain. After they pass the optic chiasm, the axons of the retinal ganglion cells are collectively known as the optic tract. The vast majority of axons of the optic tract terminate in the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN, which is the visual part of the thalamus. However, the axons of retinal ganglion cells also project to several other brain regions. Some axons of retinal ganglion cells extend to the superior colliculi, a paired structure on the roof of the midbrain. The superior colliculi help coordinate rapid movements of the eyes toward a target. Small bundles of optic tract axons also project to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the hypothalamus. Cells in the suprachiasmatic nucleus are involved in the control of daily or circadian behavioral rhythms related to the light-dark cycle. Finally, optic tract axons from still other ganglion cells go to midbrain nuclei that regulate the size of the pupil and help coordinate the movements of the eyes. The lateral geniculate nucleus serves as the primary relay nucleus for visual processing by the cerebral cortex. The right lateral geniculate nucleus receives information from the left visual field, that is, the nasal left retina and the temporal right retina, while the left lateral geniculate nucleus receives information from the right visual field, the nasal right retina and the temporal left retina. The spatial relationships among the ganglion cells in the retina are maintained in their targets as orderly representations or maps of visual space. The primate lateral geniculate nucleus has six layers, and input from the two eyes are maintained in separate layers within the LGN. Cells with input from the opposite eye are located in layers 1, 4, and 6.
Cells with input from the same eye are located in layers 2, 3, and 5. From the lateral geniculate nucleus, visual information is relayed to the visual cortex. Most of the axons from lateral geniculate neurons form the optic radiations, which terminate in the visual areas in the occipital cortex at the back of the brain. In addition to the primary visual cortex, numerous surrounding regions of the cortex are also largely visual in function. The topographic order of visual information is maintained in the visual cortex. The fovea is represented in the posterior part of the visual cortex, whereas more peripheral regions of the retina are represented in progressively more anterior regions. Note that the area of central vision, the fovea, is represented over an especially large part of the visual cortex. Inputs from the two eyes converge at the cortical level, making binocular effects possible. The primary visual cortex, V1 or striate cortex, projects to other areas of the cerebral cortex, referred to as extra striate, that are involved in complex visual perception. The dorsal stream, which includes the middle temporal area, leads from striate cortex into the parietal lobe. This system is thought to be responsible for spatial aspects of vision, such as the analysis of motion and positional relationships between objects in the visual scene. Another system, the ventral stream, leads from the striate cortex into the inferior part of the temporal lobe. This system is thought to be responsible for high-resolution form vision and object recognition. So as you got from that animation, it's the combination of the pathways and the maps that are sort of linked together. You can't easily separate them. They occur as an integral part of the whole of the processing stream. But we can understand some things about the, the maps and I want you to think of the maps as in two parts. One, you can think of the maps as was suggested in the animation as representing the visual field. So this we could call visual topography. Whereabouts in the world out there, if you're looking straight ahead, this is my left visual field, this is my right visual field, and each part of the visual field is represented in a different but neighboring part of the lateral geniculate nucleus in the primary visual cortex and in some parts of the extra striate cortex. So there's a repeated map of the visual world in these different areas. And that, so does that remind you something about something of the somatosensory system? Is there a map? of something in the somatosensory cortex? <coughs> no? Map of? What do you see in primary somatosensory cortex? Primary somatosensory cortex? There's a map of the body. Yes? Remember? And what's represented with the biggest part of space? Yep. Which <laughs> they, they represented in a larger area, right? Absolutely. And what, so that's where you have the best sensitivity, the finest <coughs> discrimination. And what do you think that might relate to? in terms of what's in your fingers. Do you have more receptors per area of finger than you have in your forehead, than you have on your arm, than you have on your back? Yeah. 
right? You have lots more receptors in your fingers. And so two-point discrimination on your finger when you take a little compass down and you say, can I determine one point from another? You say, oh, I can discriminate something that's about a millimeter and a half apart on my finger. It has to be five millimeters on your forehead and like, you know, centimeters on your back. And this is to do with the number of receptors you have and how they converge at various levels of the pathway. Remember in the animation that the central region of the visual field is occupying a much larger region of the cortex than the peripheral part of the, of the visual field. Do we have more cones per unit area in the central part of the visual field than in the peripheral part? Yeah, right? So now you could think, ah, I understand something about the general principles that the sensory pathways are using to actually represent information. More receptors in your finger, bigger area of cortex. More receptors in your eye, bigger area of cortex. So the ma and this has a term, it's called the magnification factor how much a particular area is magnified with respect to other areas. And in fact, you can do really cute experiments in the primate cortex. You can show images that have rays of uh, concentric circles and rays that go out here that are actually presented to the visual field of a monkey. And then you can look at the activity in the brain of the monkey and see how those rays are represented. And it turns out that these central rays are represented in this very big area of this flattened piece of cortex after it's been processed. And this big annulus here is represented by this area here. So this little tiny area has an area which is not much smaller than the area of the periphery, which is huge. And so that's a nice example if you ever have to describe, oh, what does magnification factor mean? You can think of, you know, big area of cortex for the finger and small amount for the back or the, the leg. Big area for the fovea, small area for the periphery. So this is how the anatomy actually speaks to function. And in fact, you could take that step one step further if you wanted to, and you could actually count the number of retinal ganglion cells in the foveal region, and you could ask exactly what the quantitative relationship was between the area of the cortex and the number of ganglion cells. So that's the kind of things that, that people do to actually make these things more formal. We said that we wanted to move from the receptive fields of retinal ganglion cells to the LGN, to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and on to the cortex. That's what the pathway does. And I showed you some examples of what perception actually tells us about how we process images. And some of the things that you notice from some of these images, that many of them have parts which are of different orientations, lines which are of different thicknesses and different lengths. And those are the kind of things you might think that we want to represent at the higher level because they are the things that pop out to us that are uh, important. But the circularly receptive, circularly symmetric receptive fields are probably not as good a uh, detector as you can get for doing this kind of processing. So remember we said that the receptive fields in the retina and the LGN were circularly symmetric. They could be on, off. And they came through, and the animation said they came through the lateral geniculate nucleus, which has these six layers. So the inputs from one eye will come 
from the contralateral eye will come to layer one, four, and six, to the ipsilateral eye, from the ipsilateral eye to layers two, three, and five. And these little dots here are, supposed, uh, uh, are the cells that are in the um, geniculate. And if you were to map the receptive fields down one of these sort of columns of cells, they would have receptive fields which were all in about the same location of visual space. So there's a, and as you moved across here, you would move in a different one direction in visual space. The receptive fields would change systematically. And you can imagine that you could move forward and back because this is a section and the receptive fields will move in a different direction of visual space. So there's a map on the, um, <coughs> on the lateral geniculate nucleus. <coughs> and what there happens to be is that there are two major divisions of the geniculate in humans, in apes, and in old world monkeys. We all have similar kind of visual pro early visual processing. We see colors. We have three types of cones. And we have geniculates, which are very similar. So when they talk about the geniculate in the animation and they say it has six layers, that means primates. If you're a cat, you actually only have two main layers and you have some sub-layers, but they're not quite the same. If you're a rat, you, you have one region which gets input mainly from the contralateral eye and a tiny little bit that gets input from the ipsilateral eye because mainly the rat doesn't have even much binocular vision. So there are big species differences. So here we're talking about the human and these, are, these divisions at the bottom have bigger cells and they're called the magnocellular layers. So layers one and two are the magno. Layers three, four, five, and six are the parvocellular layers. Parvo being small, magno being big. And you'll often see in your textbooks that these two divisions have actually quite different properties. In your textbook, it says that the M pathway is mainly associated with rods and the P pathway is associated with cones. That's wrong. Um, the M pathway is equally associated with the cones. It's just associated with cones in a different way than the parvocellular pathway. And so it turns out that it's cut off here, but it had M achromatic and P is chromatic and achromatic. So chromatic being processing of color and achromatic meaning processing of black and white. And quite a lot is made of these two different divisions of the pathways. And we'll see that they're actually kept separate somewhat in their inputs to the cortex in the next slide or two. So now we want to ask about what happens when these axons from the geniculate go into the primary visual cortex, which is the next stage of processing. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to ask about the receptor fields in the primary visual cortex. And this is what we have so far. We have the retina projecting to the LGN, the LGN to the primary visual cortex, and they have circular receptive fields. And then the primary visual cortex mainly is sending its projections out into the pre-stride cortex, um, which is the dorsal and the ventral streams. And we'll see that in a few minutes. So we can actually do some perceptual experiments that tell us lots of things about how the brain works. And I don't know whether you've discussed this much or not, but in the 1800s, there are a number of experiments done by German psychophysicists and, and physicists and, well, Helmholtz, he was a physicist and a mathematician and a, anatomist and, and everything else. So Helmholtz actually came up with the idea that we have color vision. We must have three different channels that make up color vision. And then it was later on, and these were all from behavioral experiments. Nobody knew that there were different pigments in the cones of the eye. 
at this stage. Similarly, as you may or may not have learned about that, the, well, I know that you've learned about the labeled lines, right? There are labeled lines in the skin for touch and some for pain and some for temperature. All those things were discovered by behavioral experiments or inferred from behavioral experiments. So you can learn a lot from looking at the behavior of people and animals and then infer how the, part, the brain is working. So this is one experiment I want you to do when you go home. We're not going to do it now because we just have a few moments. So the idea here is for about a minute, you should just count one, two, three, four, up to 60 or so, if you can do for two minutes. And what you do is you just move your eyes from this point to that point. One, two, three, four, five. Not looking at anything else. Right? Just backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And then after that time, come and fixate on this point and see what that set of vertical lines and that set of vertical lines appear like. How do they look to you? And then just, just write it down. And what, what do you think might happen? Anyone who's in Psych 101 minus 1. Anyone want to guess? Yeah. They, they will appear tilted. Which way do they might appear tilted? You, well, I mean, you know, why would I show it if it wasn't some, something's going to happen, right? Lo yeah, logically, opposite. They're going to, so... I'm not, I don't want to tell you the result of the experiment, right? But I will. <laughs> so you, you go here, and after you've been doing this, this, and this, this set of lines will appear as if they're tilted that way. This set of lines will appear if they're tilted that way. And so you might want to sell, say, well, why might this happen? What's happened in my brain that really this veridically vertical set of lines doesn't appear vertical anymore. I did something. What happened? And after we've gone through the next couple of stages of, of describing what the receptive fields of the neurons in the cortex are like, you might well be able to answer that question and, and I'll ask you again in a, you know, in a few moments. And you can do the same here. So you can Fixate on that, go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and then fixate on there and see what happens to these equally spaced lines above and below. See what, so just see what happens. These are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about and doing and taking home and explaining and, and describing to your buddies. <laughs> so each of these lines is actually represented by the receptive fields of a bunch of neurons distributed across them. So if I fixate here, then this is my upper visual field, this is my lower visual field, and in each of these positions I have a bunch of receptive fields. And so this image is represented by a whole population of neurons. In the early 1960s to the middle 1960s, Hubel and Weasel, we'll cut off here, studied what the receptive field properties of neurons in the visual cortex of cats and monkeys were by using tiny little microelectrodes that they could use. And they had their animals anesthetized but in such a way that their visual system was normally functioning and that they could show them visual images on a screen and they could use this electrode to actually record the extracellular pattern of action potentials, the code of the neurons, when they played different visual stimuli, just like we did for the retinal ganglion cells. So you could put spots of light and you could record those Pop, 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 pop. Those are the action potentials. That's what's shown here. And what they found 
to their surprise and to what they won the Nobel Prize for, well, that's plus a few other things, was that unlike the cells of the retina and the lateral geniculate nucleus, when you showed neurons in the cortex, the primary visual cortex, a bar which was, which was on their receptive field but oriented vertically, shown by this little yellow line here. So this is a stationary bar. Here's my receptor field somewhere here. I show a stationary bar, no response. I turn the bar of light on. I get a bunch of action potentials, and I turn it off, and it goes back to a spontaneous rate. But now I take the bar. Here's my receptor field. I turn it horizontally. If I was a retinal ganglion cell, I would respond equally well to vertical or oblique or horizontal. But look, when I turn it horizontally, they don't respond. So what they found was that there was this transformation between the lateral geniculate nucleus in the cortex that somehow the new circuitry, the new set of connections amongst the neurons, the circuits, re representing orientation. And that different cells, and what they did was when they moved their electrode down through one of the columns of the cortex, they found that most of the preferred orientations were the same. When they moved their electrode obliquely across the columns of the cortex, and the columns being little rows of cells that are about you know, one or two cells wide, 30, 40 microns, when they moved across, the preferred orient orientation changed, but it changed systematically. It's as if there was this new map, a new map of orientation on the cortex. And in fact, they found a bunch of other things. When they took a stimulus, and instead of putting it stationary on the receptive field, so here's my receptive field, here's my stimulus, I took a bar, and I moved it, I moved it across the receptor field. As I moved it, when the bar of light goes across the receptor field, the cell will fire a bunch of action potentials. In this case, it's a, a little grating, and it's moving down across the receptor field, a bunch of action potentials. Ho! Oh, when I take the same orientation grating across my receptor field, and I move it up, the cell didn't respond right here. So this cell, if you take a vertical set and you move it across that way or that way, no response. That's what you get here. So now you've found that some cells are orientation selective, some are orientation and direction selective. They're able to signal which direction something is moving in. And we can do that pretty well. We could do that when you go, if you went out into Broadway and followed my uh, instructions of Monday's lecture and looked down, you could tell whether the people were moving across to the left or the right because you have neurons which actually detect the direction of movement. There were a bunch of other psychophysical experiments about the same time that happened and so remember I showed you one way of measuring the overall sensitivity of the visual system to spatial frequencies of different bar widths, different, uh, sorry, bars of different spatial frequency, which means different widths. That's what we measured the visual system. It was like the auditory uh, sensitivity function. So... Blakemore and Campbell did an experiment where in one of their subjects they measured in this black curve the normal contrast sensitivity function. And then they measured it again. So here, contrast sensitivity. Remember these are gratings. And the contrast is the difference between the light and the dark. So if you have a very small contrast, it's a very tiny difference, and you can reduce that difference until it's just undetectable. That's your threshold, right? And now, the normal way of representing that, so you might say there's 1% of brightness difference between the dark and the light. 
the reciprocal of that measurement is the contrast sensitivity. And you often see this in perceptual measurements. So here's contrast sensitivity. So a measure of 100 is a contrast of 1%. 200 is half a percent. 10 is a contrast of 10%. And 1 is a, a grating which is completely black there and as white as you can get there. It's actually physically impossible, but almost correct. So what they did is measure this, this contrast sensitivity as a function of the different spacing of the bars. And as you can see, as the bars get very narrow, you can't see them. They get to about 10 bars per thumb width. That's when your sensitivity is the greatest. And it continues to be pretty flat. But then they did this really this experiment, just like the one I showed you before on the, uh, the, the, um, the tilt after effect. Then they asked people to look at a grating of a particular spatial frequency, shown here by this arrow at about 10 cycles per degree. And it was high contrast. Right, very, and they looked at it, looked like, looked like, looked, looked for about a minute. And then they measured the sensitivity function again. And what they found was that the sensitivity was reduced around about the same spatial frequency as the adapting grating, but not when the bar width was higher or lower. So what they've actually done here is measured the size tuning of some of the neurons or the channels that are representing this overall sensitivity function. And they did the same thing for orientation. So they measured your, your ability to discriminate orientation and then, or they could do the same experiment. So they could test your, test your ability here at a vertical orientation and do the adaptation at a horizontal and they wouldn't get any depression in this response. So what they did was they, they actually discovered some of the cortical channels that were comparable to those ones that Hubel and Weasel had shown in the cortex of the, um, of the cat. So nowadays this is what the response is. So now you might want to represent or ask about how neurons from a single neuron in the cortex might look. And so I'm just giving you an example from the work that me and my colleagues have done. Um, and so what we've done is we've recorded with a single microelectrode the activity here and the action potentials in one second as a function of orientation of a black and white grating stimulus, which is shown here, moving across the receptive field of the cell and 0 and 180 are vertical, but 0 is when it's moving to the left, 180 is when it's moving to the right. So this neuron doesn't respond to the vertical grating moving to the left or a horizontal grating, but responds beautifully going to the right. So now you take a stimulus that's of the preferred orientation and you measure the response to changing the width of the bars. And what you see here, when it's moving in the preferred direction, 180, you get tuning, which is spatial frequency tune. In the opposite direction, you get nothing. In fact, you get an inhibition below the spontaneous level. Now you do things like change the contrast. So you take this grating and you make these bars lighter and lighter, and less, less contrasty. And just above, and this is a log scale, so at about just above 2% contrast, this neuron starts firing relatively vigorously until at about 10% contrast, it's re re reached a maximum response. Now, you change how fast that stimulus is moving in the preferred direction with the preferred contrast. And so moving at a frequency of one, it's one bar of grating going across the receptor field every second, that's one hertz. The cell is not very responsive to slow movement. As the movement speed increases, it responds better and better and better until it stops responding at a higher temporal frequency. 
But another thing that's interesting, and, and I mentioned the magno and the parvo cellular divisions of the, of the uh, visual pathway. For this set of experiments, what was done was a colored grating was generated where you take the red gun and the green gun of a television display and you modulate the red gun so that it's bright here and bright there and dark there and you modulate the green gun so it's one half cycle bright there and dark there. So now you have a stimulus which is equally bright here and here. It just changes in its color. So this is called an isoluminant grating, right? No luminance contrast, no brightness contrast, just chromatic contrast, just a difference in wavelength. Now we vary the ratio of the amount of red and green as this, uh, this grating is then drifting across the receptive field of this cell. And at some ratio, around about 0.5, where the two are pretty much equally bright, the cell ceases to respond. It's colorblind. So this is what a magnocellular cell in the retina, in the gene in the, uh, retina would do. This is what a magnocellular cell in the geniculate would do. And this is what a neuron in the visual cortex, which has these other properties, will do. It's relatively colorblind. It will respond beautifully to a black and white stimulus, but not to a chromatic stimulus. So remember I said that the P cells, the P pathway, are chromatically sensitive, and the M pathway is achromatic? That's what this means. So the difference between those two pathways is partly their response to how they process color. It also turns out to be the case, so your book was half right, is that the P cells get almost no input from rods and the M cells get most of the input from the rods. So when they're doing dual work, they get... When you're, when you're in the bright environment now and your cones are working and sending you information, the M pathway is achromatic, sending you, giving you information about the black and white features of the world. And when you go to the dark, now the M pathway actually is getting information from the rods but none from, from the cones and giving you information that's processed about the darker parts of the world. So we have all this information coming into the cortex in these single cells, and then how is it arranged? And so you might have heard, and I even mentioned to you, that there's an organization of, of columns for both orientation, and we'll see in a minute, for input from the two eyes. And you can do a bunch of relatively nice experiments. Hubel and Weasel got the Nobel Prize for describing orientation using single microelectrode studies, but nowadays, what you can do is you can use the properties of neurons. And one of the properties of the neurons in the cortex is that they change the, their, their reflectance when you shine a light on them, <coughs> called the intrinsic optical signal. And that's what's happened here. There's a little chamber on the top of the head of this monkey, and there's a light shining onto the cortical surface with a camera that's actually monitoring the optical reflectance of a region of cortex which is about three millimeters by three millimeters here <laughs> as different orientations of bars are shown on a display and if you show a vertical bar you get an increase in activity in these regions which are lit, lit up here by yellow so this doesn't actually mean that there's a yellow part of the cortex this is this is the region where there was increased activity if you show a horizontal bar, a different region becomes more active. And if you actually look at one of these regions more closely, you can see that as you go from 
vertical through 45 to horizontal through 135, you get a change in the representation, an orderly change in orientation representation. So this is a sort of global looking look at the orientation columns of the cortex. And that's centered on this region, which is called a pinwheel. So now this is another level of organization of the brain. And we haven't mentioned how the inputs from the two eyes actually get organized together. So remember the geniculate has inputs from the contralateral eye in one set of layers, from the ipsilateral eye in another set, but they're from corresponding points of the visual space shown here, and they actually come into the cortex in neighboring regions into the layer called layer four, and you will have seen these layers in the uh, lab that you did on the anatomy section of the uh, lab course where you looked at the cortical layers. So the inputs mainly come to layer four in, the, in you and I and uh, monkeys to layer four C, and those from the right eye are neighboring those with the left eye, neighboring from the right eye, left right. These are called ocular dominance columns. So these are about half a millimeter apart. So the orientation columns are about you know, 50 microns apart. And the or ocular dominance columns, or the eye dominance columns, are about half a millimeter apart. And Hubel and Weasel actually put together a model of how these actually combined on the surface of the cortex. So here are those left and right eye columns. Here are the orientation domains. And so what you can imagine that for each of these eye dominance columns, you have an orderly representation of orientation around each eye dominance column. But how does that tell us about binocular things? So I know, can you free fuse? If you fuse those two objects there, what you should see, just make your eyes come together, look at, look at the bridge of your nose, you should actually see a third cylinder pop right out at you if you just look at them, and that cylinder will have depth. And that's what the ability of two eyes do for you. They give you binocular information about depth, and we did that test. We said, can you touch the end of your finger when one eye is closed, or, and you're not very good at it, but when both eyes are open, you're very good at it. Same, same idea. You have ability to judge where something is relative to a different position and depth. That's what called binocular disparity, and the inputs from these two sets of eye dominance columns come together in the in neurons which are connected by their axons and the little circuits here to actually signal different depth planes. So some neurons will signal when an object is further away from the fixation point and some will signal when it's closer to the fixation point. So now we have orientation, spatial frequency, binocular disparity, we have some neurons that are colorblind. And I'm just going to tell you that we have some neurons which allow us to segment color. And that's beautifully exemplified in this uh, set of pictures here. So you can see here on your left the black and white version of this picture where the flowers are not very obvious in the black and white picture, but they're beautifully segmented in the color version. The white flowers, which are actually brighter than the background, you can see them pretty well in both, both pictures. But the purple on green, where the purple and the green are about the same brightness, just like that isoluminant grating I showed you, right? you don't segment those very well. We do other things with color, you know, so we can take Mr. Jean's frog here and say, oh, well, you know, he looks like he's got genes on his back legs. Uh, we can take the fruit and these different sets of apples. We can segment the different groups of apples by their color. If they were black and white, 
we wouldn't know whether these apples were the same as those were the same as those, or even whether they were apples. Another really cute thing is that we can actually take colors and determine that the background will actually modulate what we see. So here, the annual and the review are actually painted in the same color. So you probably can't see that well from, from the back here, but see this little line here, a little greenish line? That's, paint, that's the same color here as it is here. But if we put a yellow line through the review, the neighboring influence of the yellow line on this turns this to be more green and changes it from putting a purple line through this set to change it to be you know, a darker turquoise. And similarly, these, this orange line is the same color in the of and the psychology. But depending on what the neighboring colors are, that will change. And so this is a really nice example of the fact that what you see is not really what's out there, right? That's influenced by how your brain is interpreting the colors. And the way that we represent color is that, if you remember, we have three, we have cones, and I mentioned that we have three different types of cones. We have ones that respond preferentially to short wavelengths, called the S cones. Ones that respond preferentially to middle length wavelengths, and one set that respond preferentially to longer wavelengths. Although these two are pretty close together. And we have retinal ganglion cells. <coughs> so groups of retinal ganglion cells that have on and off receptive fields. But some of those ganglion cells are getting inputs to their receptive field centers from the short wavelength cones and to their surrounds by a mixture of the L and the M cones. And so these are the, called the yellow-blue. And there are other ganglion cell, uh, retinal ganglion cells in the P pathway that get input to their receptive field center from an M cone and to their surrounding region from an L cone. You can think of those as some people will call them ML, more politically correct than green-red, but you can think of them as green-red. <laughs> and they are also in the P pathway. So these are red versus green. Remember I said the achromatic M colorblind cells, they combine the inputs from the M and the L cones in their receptive field centers. So that's why they're colorblind. And so we can actually get quite a lot of information about color from knowing about these different retinal ganglion cells. But that's not quite all, because remember I showed you that the annual and the psychology actually respond, they change their responses depending on what's outside them. And so in the retina and the LGN and in some cortical cells, you have groups of neurons which have a circularly symmetric receptive fields with an L on and M off or a L off, M on, for example. <laughs> in the cortex, we think that these are combined to be chromatically double opponent, but they're offset from each other. So they become both orientation selective and color selective. So they're unlike that neuron that I showed you before. These neurons will respond very well to a oriented red-green grating. like this guy here. So in the next 30 seconds, we have one tiny thing further to cover, the whole of how you recognize objects. But the good thing is, we actually don't know very much about it.
So we know something. And so the very last thing I want to tell you about is the other part of what I'm calling visual topography is the specialization of the visual areas beyond the primary visual cortex. So we know that when you have one of these experiments that I mentioned right at the beginning with uh, people with strokes, if you have a cortical lesion or a lot of information come, came from people in the First World War who had bullet wounds to their brains, for example, if you have a lesion of the primary visual cortex, you're effectively blind in the area that's destroyed. You might be able to, you know, move to some part of the visual world, but you can't be aware of anything. But in particular areas of the extra striate cortex, if you lose their visual function, like the fusiform face area, then you're not well able to recognize objects. But what, what I didn't tell you was the woman who had the inability to recognize faces or to be able to say, you know, this is a red, um, a red plastic container with a little slit cut in it. If you gave her a coin and said, put it in the slit, she, if the slit was vertical, she could take the coin and she could slot it in the slit that was vertical. If it was horizontal, she could take the coin and put it in the slit that was horizontal. So someone who'd had a, pri a lesion of primary visual cortex couldn't do that. that. They will be unable to do that. But this person was aware of being able to make the movements and do things, just can't name the things, can't recognize them. And so that brings up this idea that there are two different pathways that were mentioned right at the beginning. One that says, what's going on, objects and things that you recognize, and another, where they are. So this is the ventral stream, primary visual cortex, to V2, to V4, to the inferior temporal cortex. The dorsal stream is the where to MT and MST. And I have one more slide and then we're finished. Okay. And so one classic set of experiments was done where Way back in the 1970s, uh, Semir Zeki discovered that one of these pre-stride areas called V5 or MT or MST had a whole preponderance of neurons that were responsive to the direction of movement. And people have gone on to show that when, this, when you record neurons in this area, they respond preferentially to the movement when you specifically inactivate this region, people are not, or, or monkeys are not able to make smooth eye movements to follow a moving object, for example. But they were able to actually recognize colors or such like, right? So there's this whole idea now that there are specialized areas for different aspects of vision. Not that they're independent, they actually talk to each other, but that's the next level of taking all the information that I've told you about in processing in V1 and is putting it together for object recognition in these areas. And the final example of that was the face and object area that we talked about right at the beginning. So that's in the what pathway in infratemporal cortex, the fusiform face area. Okay, thanks. <laughs>